Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, if you would. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, we will be at. Now, even though those of you who were here on Christmas Eve saw that we had wise men in the children's uh, presentation at 10 o'clock, and we had uh, the wise men... um, dramatic presentation the 11 o'clock so we could work We Three Kings into the program, which was one of our favorites. Um, In actuality, the wise men that are often pictured at the the manger um, were not there in real life. They came later. Uh, Probably when Jesus was more than a year old, they came and found him in a house, not a manger. Might have had a dog, probably not a herd of sheep or other barnyard animals. Um, And so we're going to look today at these star chasers, or the magi, as they're often referred to. Um, With kids, we see many cartoon depictions of the wise men, and a lot of liberties are taken. Um, And so we're going to look at the biblical account and get a better idea from Scripture um, of these uh, individuals. Let's look together. Hear the word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another root. We always picture three because of the three gifts they brought, but there might have been many more that came on the expedition. Let's bow our heads. So Lord, we are thankful for this look at your word today. Help us to learn from the wise men, the magi from the east, as we um, look forward to a new year and all of the uh, joy, adventures, and uncertainty that brings, might we be guided by you in the process. Amen. So Bethlehem means, does anyone know this? House of Bread. House of Bread is Bethlehem. Um, Interesting name, some would say. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, a town five miles south of Jerusalem. It had previously been called Ephrath. You can see where they would change it. Ephrath doesn't have a real, you know, vacation-y ring to it. Going to Ephrath for the weekend. And it was here that Jacob buried Rachel and set a pillar in her memory. This is Genesis 48, verse 7. It was here that Ruth had lived when she married Boaz. Ruth 1.22. And most importantly, Bethlehem was the home of David and remained in the history of Israel 
uniquely as the city of David. Um, even to this day in Jerusalem, when we were there um, on our trip last year, or well, almost last year, um, we were touched by how many people refer to it as the city of David and the, and the rich ties to David that the city still holds. Um, the question was once posed, what would have happened if there had been three wise women instead of wise men? This is a joke part. This is not a serious part. So you can laugh at this part if you want to. Thank you, Scott. It's already getting me started. The answer was they would have asked for directions immediately upon commencing their trip, which would have allowed them to arrive on time. They would have helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and brought cute little outfits for the baby to wear. See, it sounded good when I was reading over it. Thank you. I got a stomp from Joel. The difference between... They were a year later after the baby was... Okay. It's a journey. That's right. Um, so we know they were not present on that first Christmas when the Lord was born. They didn't arrive on the scene until after a year later. Um, there were probably a greater number of people involved with this caravan that was probably traveling for more than two years. Now, I know in the cartoons or in the, or in the manger scenes, we see three people dressed in noble uh, eastern garb carrying their boxes. But more than likely, this was actually a great caravan. Uh, a great number of people. Of, there would have been guards or would have been servants. It would have been really something to behold, not three rogues on camels going out across the desert. They're called the Magi, simply in the scripture that we just read. And we think they came from Persia, from Persia and were probably some form of priest. Now, historically, these, these priests or these, or these spiritual leaders would have been different from the organized religion that we know of today. So it was a different kind of, these were more of a, teacher, philosophy, study of science, kind of a, of a group of people that probably were instrumental in educating royalty of the country they were from. So this is kind of the background that we have. Um, they may have been Babylonian, Arabian, Persian. The Bible never clearly defines where in the East they are from. And I would say to you, because of that, it's actually not important for the message that is being conveyed. If you're aware of the four Gospels, you'll remember that Matthew's Gospel, where we have the Magi present, was actually written for what people group? Do you remember this? Written for the Jewish people. The entire book of Matthew is, is telling the people and showing them how Jesus fulfilled the promises in Scripture that would define who the Messiah would be, and, and he goes about this from a very Jewish point of view. So he, in, he introduces the Magi as foreigners to a very Jewish audience for a purpose. The Magi were known as people of holiness, wisdom, and interpreters of dreams. They studied science, and the star... Um, that they saw must have been extraordinary for them to stop and follow it as they did. And most experts would say the Magi represent for us all Gentiles to a Jewish audience. So here we have this group of Gentiles with no Jewish background, and they've come from afar to worship this child king. It sounds kind of fantastical, right? Yet here they are, and they represent a wisdom and an understanding that the Jewish people had missed. Are you with me? And in this way, the author, again, and we know that all of God's word it was, was put together by God, is, is definitive for us as God breathed. And, and God is showing even the Jewish people the importance of Jesus as a Savior for all. As a Savior for all.
I want to talk for a moment about why these were wise people. The first thing is this. They recognized God at work in the world surrounding them. They recognized that God was doing something through their study of science and the stars and whatever other leadings the Holy Spirit would have given them. They knew that, that a magnificent king was born. They knew that there was something there, and even though they didn't have all the facts, they went and searched for him. They were very limited on, on their information at best. They were very limited and yet they stopped everything and they went and looked for him. Would you say that takes great faith, everyone? It's a question now. It takes great faith. I mean, there are so many of us that, that want to have everything proved to us before we believe, right? It's very common in our society. Yes, I will go if you will show me beyond a shadow of a doubt that my goal will be achieved. And yet we have these people, these teachers, people of, of great nobility in whatever country they're from, and they've stopped, they've put their lives on hold to go and search for this miraculous one of God, this son of God, who they don't even know the details of, but they know enough that it, that it moves them by faith to stop their norm and look for the exceptional. And I would say that a lot of us need that. A lot of us need that. We need to find the exceptional. What's the thing that God is doing that we need to chase? What's the thing that God is doing that we need to chase? You know, I think that for a lot of, a lot of folks, they come to Jesus and they're content with having come to him, but they haven't sought him for the extraordinary. And I believe that God is inviting all of us to a place of deeper revelation, of deeper understanding, and realizing the extraordinary that he has for their lives. The Magi recognized that God was at work in the world, and it was revealed to them as they went about their search. Even through the little that they had, we have the whole New and Old Testaments, this complete definitive work of God. Isn't that great? My daughter's into books. There's always one more, right? There's always more books in the series. Even movies now. There's one more movie in the series. I heard they're going to make over 20 Star Wars movies in the next 20 years. They're slated for 20 over 20 years. It's already been approved. And yet God, God says, here is what I want you to know, but he also doesn't stop there. Remember at the end, if, if all the things he'd done, there'd be, done had been recorded, would there be filled more than every bookshelf? Remember this? I'm paraphrasing. Scott, paraphrasing. Close. God doesn't stop there, but he gives us a great picture to lead us on the journey for more. And certainly nothing that he does goes against the word that he's given us. That's what makes the Bible so amazing. We will find answers to, to, to questions of our lives now in the scriptures when we read. It's continually proven over and over to be right. The wise men were wise in the way that they searched for Jesus. They searched for Jesus. Or they followed the star wherever it led them, as far as it went. You ever get those days where you're, like, you're in the mood for a, for a certain thing? Maybe it's a sandwich, a really good sandwich. Anybody? Sure, right? Yeah. But if it's too far, you don't, it's really not worth it. You know what I mean? If it's convenient on the way home, okay, great. But if I've got to get in the car and drive for like 20 minutes, you know? And here they are, the convenience is not there. They have stopped everything, and they are going to go as far as it takes to find what they're looking for. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which 
hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the question for us this morning is how hungry are we in our search for God? The Magi would not be satisfied until they found God. And for a lot of us, there's a convenience in our search or in our prayer, but if it's challenging, we really walk away oftentimes. We don't want to push after it. And the Magi showed us the value of pushing after that which they knew they could find if they, if they were um, committed in their search. They were discerning as they went about. They came across Herod... How many of you think that they thought Herod was a great guy? Probably not. Herod was well known to be abusive, to be dark, to be controlling. He probably was not the most warm, welcoming figure. And they discerned that as they went. They were open to God speaking to them as they were going so they could come home by a different route because they were listening to what God was saying on their journey. We also find something else in this. God led them away from the trap of Herod because they were listening, they were seeking him. The entire time they sought the star, but as they went, they asked, where do we go? You catch that? They went to Herod looking for directions. Sometimes we're afraid to ask for directions. Sometimes we're afraid to look, we're afraid to ask, we're afraid to spend time with someone who can help us understand things better for a number of different reasons. But we have the reality that God will direct us in our search if we ask him from the scripture today. And I believe that's true. If I'm looking for an answer from God, I will spend time in the word, time in prayer, and he will always give us an answer. Even if sometimes the answer is not now or not yet. But there will always be an answer for us. And we know that God is always at work for the good of those who love him. He always wants us to find that desire of our heart. Um, the next point here is they were dependent, the Magi were, in their search. It's one thing to start the search. It's another thing to accept where the search leads. They went as far as they had to go. I really like this side of it. The importance that with God, oftentimes, we're called to give more or do more or seek longer, but that if we're faithful to the journey, we will find what we're looking for. Now, they brought three, three gifts. We know the gifts? We all know the gifts? Most of us know the gifts? Yep, so I heard someone say it. The first one is gold. Gold had obvious worth. It was a gift fit for royalty. God deserves the very best that we can bring. We saw in the Old Testament that um, the sacrifices, animal sacrifices, were supposed to be the, the best of the herd. And if, those, if someone gave you know, the, the sheep that kind of you know, teetered off to one side or, or had speckles or was kind of sickly anyway and probably wasn't going to last for long, they'd bring that to God for that sacrifice? That was shunned upon. That God deserves our best. The very best that we can bring in our heart. The very best that we can bring in worship. Even when things aren't going well. Jesus is called Lord 747 times in the New Testament. They brought their best. The second thing was this. They brought a gift worthy of the Lord's holiness they brought frankincense. Frankincense. It was mentioned 17 times in Scripture. It was used, of one of, as, it was used as one of four sweet scents compounded together to make the ceremonial incense of the Jews. Frankincense is a picture of praise and worship of Christ as the Holy One of God come down in flesh among us. And the third thing they brought was myrrh. Myrrh was used in Egypt in the embalming process. Myrrh was a prophetic gift. Remember Matthew 1.21 that says, Mary will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 
talks about him being one who was born to die. The Magi brought the best that they had to worship the one who was worthy. And it's really fun because when you think about it, what was their legacy? They probably did amazing and beautiful things in the countries they were from. But all those things have been long forgotten. Their legacy was their conviction and their commitment to pursue and find the Lord at any cost. And they were successful in their journey. And we remember them every year in songs and stories through Scripture. Makes you wonder, was anybody else invited that said no to the invitation? Might there have been four groups of, of, of wise men or shepherds that maybe also had an encounter but said to themselves, you know, there's too many other things that are too important in life right now. I'll get there eventually. One of these days, I'm going to go down to Bethlehem where I heard that the Savior was, and one of these days I'll get down there and I'll see this one that's been talked about. Who knows how many others had supernatural encounters with angels uh, who were led by the stars, whatever it was, but they stopped or they said no along the way. And we wonder just for a moment, will we be the ones that pursue God at any cost and find what he has for us? Let's pray together. Lord, one aspect of our faith that so often gets overlooked because there are so many things that we're praying for that we want to see happen or have in our lives where they are currently. That aspect of faith that gets so often overlooked is that we're called. Our purpose is to pursue you. Our purpose is to seek out where you are. No matter the cost and to discover those things that you have called us to, invited us to walk with you in, in partnership. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and the courage and the boldness to go where you are inviting us, that we would grow in our faith and in our effectiveness in bringing your kingdom here on earth. We are brokers of your kingdom. We are people who were called to bring into the world the things of your kingdom, Lord. That's your heart for us. So as we go and as we prepare for a new year, speak to us clearly in regard to what pursuing you and walking out life with you would look like in 2018. Lord God, more of you at any cost should be the desire of each of our hearts. And as we find you, we can trust that you have only the best for us. Lord, let us pursue you in the journey and find the great things, the greatness that you've called us to. Thank you, Lord, this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate.